Hello, it's Jacqueline Harris here. I'm just going to give you a moment to see if anyone jumps on. I'm going to change my headset over too. So hopefully you can hear me okay now. Um, if you come on, um, just let me know if you can hear me okay and then I'm going to get started. So welcome. Um, I'm looking forward to chatting with you tonight. If we haven't met already, my name is Jacqueline Harris and I'm an IVF and pregnancy strategist. I'm a natural fertility expert I'm an, and I'm a naturopath. So I work a lot with women who are trying to conceive naturally, but particularly have a special interest in helping women who are trying to prepare for IVF, get their body as healthy as it could possibly be for IVF and make sure they're going into it feeling confident, um, in their fertility, feeling nice and calm and feeling like they've done everything they can to prepare for their cycle. So every week you're going to see me jumping on to have a chat with you about a different topic that either comes up with the women that I'm speaking to in clinic uh, or a topic that's just consistently um, getting questions about. So seeing as though this week is, or this month is Endometriosis Awareness Month, I thought there's no better topic for us to talk about tonight than um, endometriosis, talking about natural medicine and also how this even affects IVF or why you even need to worry about it if you are going through IVF. So let me get into this. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments and I'll answer them if we get time at the end um, or if it's relevant to what I'm talking about, I'll certainly answer it as we go. So if you have endometriosis, you probably are already aware of what it is, but I'm gonna just give you a little bit of a rundown about it anyway. It's a very common condition. It, we've got statistics that say it probably affects around one in 10 women. Um, that's a lot of women worldwide. I think they say 176 million women worldwide would have endometriosis. But we don't even know if those statistics are 100% accurate because a lot of women probably don't get diagnosed um, with having the condition. So on average, our research has shown that it takes women between seven to 10 years to actually get their diagnosis or a delay in their diagnosis of endometriosis, which is pretty intense. It means a woman can be having debilitating symptoms for seven to 10 years before she has a definitive awareness of what's actually going on in her body. Now, partly that could come because women just aren't seeking help early enough. Uh, and that can be because of the normalization of symptoms. Um, a lot of women think it's normal to have painful periods or they've always had uncomfortable or painful sex. So they think that that's normal for them. Uh, maybe they've always had really intense bowel symptoms before or with their period and they just think that's normal that's just what you expect by having a, a menstrual cycle uh, and they're not they're, those alone are not the symptoms of just of endometriosis but there's some common ones that women will put up with and sometimes women will put up with debilitating pain like not being able to function pain blacking out because the pain is so bad and some women put up with that as their normal cycle other women go along to their doctor and just the time frame with which they either get there or the time frame which they navigate their way through the medical system, then to their gynecologist and then to surgery for a definitive diagnosis um, can take that long. And this is pretty intense because we know that, and research study, there's a study that I read uh, that's saying it's from 2006, so it's not a particularly new study, but saying that we know that the effects of endometriosis are far, far afield than just the physical symptoms, as debilitating as those can be. They affect women emotionally, mentally, financially, they're affecting their relationships. Uh, so it's affecting women uh, as a career, it's affecting women on just about every level that you can possibly think of. And so it is a really, really important for us um, to, a really important topic for us to discuss. Now, the symptoms can be varied. Some women, it is what I mentioned, um, painful periods, painful sex or uncomfortable sex. It might be um, bowel symptoms. It might be some unusual bleeding or swelling at a different part of their body around the time they have their period. So the symptoms can be very varied, but for a lot of women, they'll just put up with those symptoms until it gets to the time that they're actually actively trying to conceive. 
And even then, there's still some women will roll along with those symptoms thinking that perhaps it's normal, that's just what my body does. And then it gets to the point in time where they are, maybe they've been trying for 12 months already, and they've gone to see their doctor and gone, you know, I don't think this is right. My period is really painful or I'm, and I've been trying to conceive for this long. So for some women, it is the fertility struggles that can come up. And it doesn't necessarily always come up, but they can come up for some women who have endometriosis. That will sometimes be the trigger that gets them to the doctor to do the investigation, uh, which is laparoscopy, which is surgery, um, to diagnose that there is actually endometriosis present. Now, what is it? Endometriosis is where, so it's where the tissue, the, in, the, 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 like the endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus, it's tissue like the endometrium is growing outside of the uterus in places where it shouldn't grow. Uh, and a large majority of the time that's within the pelvic cavity, uh, commonly on the ovaries or the fallopian tubes uh, or in and around um, the bowel even. But it has been found in the most unusual places. Uh, there's a, a, a study or a, a case where I've read a woman spontaneously, she'd been having her periods as an 18 year old wo woman. She'd sp been spontaneously bleeding for 13 years already. Uh, sorry, she, since, since she was 13, so five years already. And then spontaneously for three months in a row, she started bleeding out of her nail bed every time she had a period. And when they uh, decided that the only option was to remove the tissue and they tested it and they found that that was endometrial-like tissue living in her finger um, underneath her nail bed. Uh, it's been found in um, the nasal passages of people, so literally a nosebleed um, every month around the time that they've got their period. So it literally has been found in just about everywhere you can think of the lungs. So it's when endometrial-like tissue lives outside of the uterus and it behaves and responds to the hormones the same way the endometrium does. So it will um, build up, it will proliferate, and it um, sheds or bleeds um, around the same time when you have your period. So for women, that can cause um, a lot of symptoms. Uh, and depending where it is, it can, it can change the symptoms. So if it's on the bowel, the symptoms can be really intense pain passing a bowel movement, uh, particularly around the time of a period, although it might not be. It might be leading up to the period or at ovulation. It could be really um, like irritable bowel-like symptoms. Uh, so uh, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of gas, a lot of uncomfortableness in the bowel around that time. So symptoms can be um, quite varied. And interestingly with all the research that people are doing into endometrio excuse me into endo now into endometriosis now we don't know definitively what causes it uh, there are some common factors that are believed to be involved uh, but we're not a hundred percent sure exactly what that what the cause is uh, which make which means there's not a cure and, and having a hysterectomy is not a cure for endometriosis because if you leave your ovaries in place and that endometrial-like tissue is living outside of the uterus and the ovaries are still doing their job, even though the uterus is not there anymore, that endometrial-like tissue will still be responding and could still cause the same sort of symptoms. So there is absolutely not a 100% cure uh, for endometriosis, and which is very interesting that we haven't got to that place yet and hopefully for everyone who is dealing with endometriosis we reach that point soon but when you look at some of the contributing factors as to what's actually going on and what has been found or some of the theories that are, are, are presenting as possibly or likely factors naturopathically and holistically these are the things that we try to work with so there's one theory that perhaps it begins with uh, retrograde flow, which is where instead of the flow um, moving its way down and out of the uterus through the cervix and through the vagina, that it might go back up through the fallopian tubes and back into the woman's uh, pelvis. And so that is one theory that has been thrown around. And I remember uh, writing an ebook about endometriosis. It must be 13 years ago now. And at that time, this was what we thought was a likely um, factor was this retrograde flow. Now, it's, it's not, we're not convinced that that's a factor, but it's a possibility still. It's not been definitively ruled out. Um, there's the possibility that the immune system uh, plays a role. People were throwing around the idea of it being autoimmune. It doesn't quite fit the picture of an autoimmune disease, so it's not likely that. Although the immune system is something that we definitely consider from a naturopathic point of view or a holistic point of view. Uh, 
now, what we have found in research, though, is that it's an estrogen dependent or an estrogen dominant condition. So when they've actually studied the endometrial cells living outside, endometrium like cells living outside of the endometrium, they have found that that tissue is dependent on estrogen and given estrogen, it will proliferate and it will grow. So that, that estrogen is definitely a factor. Uh, and when you research how you can improve that, um, we see that when you work with say um, estrogen modulating herbs, that it can actually make a difference uh, to what happens with that tissue. So therefore that this estrogen dependent nature of endometrial like tissue outside of the endometrium is definitely a factor that we have found. But why this is happening or how the tissue gets there, we're not 100% sure. Again, when I wrote that ebook many, many years ago, I remember reading research that was suggesting it was congenital and people were born with that, with it, which matches up with the fact that they have found a case um, in men, a man. Uh, so, yeah, it's not 100% sure, but we get, when I'm, when I'm working with someone, I get to all the underlying issues that we have identified as possible factors and work out which of these could be a concern for that particular woman. Now, in clinic, I've literally worked with hundreds of women who have endometriosis. In clinic, it often surprises me. Uh, one, because it's not necessarily the woman that has the most severe symptoms that will have the most severe case of endometriosis. Some women, I'll be pretty sure based on their symptoms that when they go through the system and get to their gynecologist and have their laparoscopy, that we're going to see quite intense endometriosis. And generally when the symptoms are that intense, we find they found some endometriosis, but it certainly, it might not be stage four, it might not be intense as what we anticipate. And then I've had women that have gone to have a laparoscopy, a laparoscopy more as an exploratory surgery because they're ruling out everything that's important for their fertility. Uh, it's come up that they've got really, really intense endometriosis um, at quite a high, um, a high level. So through the bowel, completely through the pelvis, and so it, it is one of these conditions that completely surprises me. And the other side of this is it can be surprising in that some women who have pretty intense endometriosis and have been told their whole life or since, in their, since they've been menstruating and when they found endometriosis that they were going to have trouble conceiving, they have got pregnant within three or six months, like very, very quickly with no issues at all. And I've got one woman who that happened to both times, very, very easily, no issue, issues getting pregnant whatsoever, although she'd been warned for 10 years already that she would have a lot of problems conceiving. And uh, conversely to that, I've got women that have the lower stages of endometriosis and have had a long journey to have their baby. Now, whether that's because of the endometriosis or lots of other factors that may have been going on in their body, don't know the exact answer, but just letting you know that it can be quite surprising in its nature. Now, if you're here, I'm assuming that you're curious as to why you would need to consider endometriosis if you're planning, preparing or going through IVF. I've got a lot of women that tell me they go to their doctor, they end up getting to that place where they have their surgery, they either excise it or burn it and then they're told that, okay, we've dealt with that part, uh, the endometriosis is gone, um, we can just go ahead with the IVF and in fact now is the best time to do it in these next three cycles, um, six cycles within the next three often um, because the endometriosis is gone and if it, there's a chance, of course, there's a chance that it will come back. So I've got women that just um, have been told that information and wholeheartedly um, just decide that's what they want to do. And that's very valid that getting in and working at a time when those endometrial cells are gone might be beneficial. We also need to consider what these underlying factors are that might be contributing to the endometriosis and the growth of that. Why is it going to come back? Uh, because uh, if we don't deal with the underlying issues that are causing or contributing to the endometriosis or um, the symptoms that you're having, it's it, we're not really getting your body as, as healthy and as fertile as it can be um, to give you the best outcome for IVF. So tonight I want to present to you three things or three areas that I think are really important for you to consider if you're preparing, planning or going in to IVF. Uh, now, 
I just want to also add in here, if you're like every other woman that I know that's going through IVF, unless you have severe male factor, um, which even still, you're probably trying in the months leading up to your IVF cycle anyway. Uh, so again, why wouldn't you work with these factors in the hope that maybe it will still happen in those months preceding you beginning IVF, uh, which has happened. I've definitely seen women that have, have had that happen. Um, so even from that perspective, to give it a good chance anyway, um, you'd want to work with these, um, to work with these factors. Now the three areas that I think you need to work with, um, and obviously this is pretty general information because I don't know your specific case, I don't know what's happening with you and your partner's fertility, uh, but very general information that most women with endometriosis can um, begin to focus on or, or consider whether it's useful for them. There's three things that I think we need to match up together. The first of those things that we need to work on balancing your hormones out, and I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail with you about this. So we need to balance your hormones, Simultaneously, we need to work on um, your digestion because this is a really important factor for the balance of your hormones. And thirdly, the third piece of the puzzle that I want us to begin to look at tonight is making sure that we work on uh, inflammation that's in your body. As I mentioned, you would want to consider all these factors even if the endometriosis has been removed because possibly these were issues that allow the endometriosis to proliferate in your body in the first place. Um, so I mentioned that endometriosis has been found to be an estrogen dependent condition. So if we want to work on uh, balancing your hormones, uh, we need to make sure that we're helping in the clearance of estrogen um, and also relative to what's happening with progesterone. Not every single woman is going to have an estrogen dominance uh, but possibly it is a commonality that comes up with people with endometriosis and estrogen dominance is where we talk about a relative difference between what's happening with estrogen and progesterone in the body. Whether or that's because estrogen is too high or whether that's because progesterone is too low or a bit of both. Um, so it's possible that there's estrogen dominance but not every woman's going to have estrogen dominance. Like I said, we just, but we do know that the tissue is estrogen dependent. So one factor that I want to leave with you tonight about this uh, estrogen dependence is that um, a study from, what is it, 2013, um, so it's not a new study, it's a study from 2013, was showing, uh, looking at the effect of curcumin, which is um, an active constituent of turmeric, uh, actually modulated and changed the way the uh, endometrial or endometrial-like tissue was impacted outside of the uterus. And so to turmeric um, in your diet or curcumin as a supplement, you'd need to talk to either myself or your practitioner about that, um, whether it's, it's a good option for you. But turmeric in your diet would definitely be something that would be worthwhile exploring. And because of the effect that it can have on um, estrogen in the body in a positive way for the uh, endometrial tissue. There are other things that are worthwhile exploring. There's DIM, there's broccoli sprouts, there's liver clearance, there's a whole lot of other stuff that we can look at doing if this estrogen dependence is something that we need to consider as a piece of the puzzle for you. Um, but just know that balancing your hormones is a key piece of the puzzle if you want to go, if you're going into IVF or if you're trying to conceive naturally before IVF um, and you've been diagnosed with um, endometriosis. While we're balancing the hormones, it's really important for us to consider what's happening with your digestion. One, because a lot of women with endometriosis have pretty intense digestive symptoms. Um, and for some women, they've just gone for, as I mentioned, years and years and years thinking that they have irritable bowel syndrome. And so one, helping them symptomatically is really important. And that can be worthwhile considering um, what you're eating and what are your trigger foods. But the other really important factor for digestion is that it's a key piece of the uh, puzzle to helping an estrogen clearance. The bacteria that live in your bowel can really uh, change the way your body uses the estrogen and converts it into a different type of estrogen, a, a pro-inflammatory type of estrogen. So what's happening in your digestive tract is really important as well. So you might like to consider whether fermented foods or a probiotic with specific strains for what going, is going on in your health. Um, is of relevance for you. And then the third thing that I want you to consider tonight, which is a really, really important piece of the puzzle, is inflammation. Now, let's just say you're going through an IVF cycle and you do everything you can to prepare your body and you work on creating healthy eggs, 
your partner's working on um, a, a tr making his body as healthy as he can to produce healthy sperm, and you get a beautifully healthy, or what seems like a very healthy embryo, and then you go in for your transfer, and you're waiting to see whether this little um, embryo implants. If there's inflammation in your body, it's not ideal case, it's not an ideal scenario for um, embryo implantation. There has been some research showing that there can be an increased chance of um, uh, ectopic or pregnancy uh, related miscar miscarriages um, if the endometriosis is really highly present in the, um, within the fallopian tubes. So you don't want to have high levels of inflammation affecting the little hair-like um, cilia that are in the fallopian tubes. That wouldn't be ideal. So treating this inflammation is really, really important. Uh, there's a, lots of other things that I'm looking forward to talking to you about down the track, which is very, very important to also help with embryo implantation, although not specific to endometriosis. So wait till um, we get talking about that one another time. But addressing the inflammation that might be there in your body is really, really important as well. And so you might like to um, think about uh, things that help to make your body anti-inflammatory. Uh, there's a pathway in our body which uh, produces prostaglandins or inflammatory markers and if you can change that pathway it can reduce the inflammation so making sure you've got lots of essential fatty acids in your diet uh, you might like to increase some fish or talk to myself or your practitioner about um, fish oil whether that's a good one for you to be taking um, but you also need to look at what might be causing inflammation in your body is your body more inflammatory because of the foods that you're eating is your body more inflammatory because of stress? Uh, and that might be just day-to-day, -day, everyday type stress, or it might be big stuff. It might be your fertility. Uh, so we need to factor in stress management as, an, management as an important part of reducing inflammation in your body as well. Is your body more inflammatory because you're carrying extra weight? Uh, now the other thing with extra weight that I should have mentioned is that adipose or fat tissue um, does produce uh, more estrogen in your body and in an estrogen dependent condition that's not something that we want either. So um, getting yourself into a healthy body weight um, and what that is for you I don't know but getting you into a healthy body weight um, leading into your IVF cycle is, is ideal as well. So those are the key pieces of the puzzle that I want you to consider tonight and I'm going to go back over them again. Firstly, you want to balance your hormones and at this stage, knowing that it's an estrogen dependent condition, we want to make sure we're trying to help in the clearance of estrogen from your body. And like I said, a place for you to start might be exploring um, whether turmeric is a good idea for you, um, dietary or supplemented. Um, and you might like to uh, factor in what's happening with your body weight. The second thing is that um, your digestion is a really key piece of the puzzle to help in estrogen clearance and to also make sure you are, um, your, your bacteria in your bowel is helping with that, but also making sure that you're not producing inflammation in your body because of what you're eating. And the third piece is specifically inflammation. So what's causing inflammation in your body and what can you do to help improve that, whether that's as simple as increasing more um, and including more essential fatty acids in your diet or looking at the full picture and working out what is causing the inflammation in your body. Now I know that's probably a lot of information for you to take in in one mouthful, um, but if you have any questions, um, before I wrap up, I'm gonna open this up for you to ask me um, any questions that you have. Um, Facebook is a little bit of a delay, so I'll give it just a moment to see if anyone has anything to ask me. I'm not gonna mention your name in the video, so um, if I use this as recording, no one will see what your name is. Um, if you don't have any questions, that's totally fine as well. You can always post them um, or send um, them to me in the comments later and I can reply back to you that way. So if you are preparing for IVF, if you are thinking about it, if you're planning it or if you're just about to start it, I want to make sure you've downloaded my IVF checklist. It's very, very simple and it's across the board for anyone and everyone who's beginning to prepare or planning to go into IVF. This simple checklist goes over things to help you feel really confident, knowing that you've done everything you can to prepare and so that you can feel calm and surrender to the process and then also enjoy it because you feel like you've done just all the little steps, everything that you can, can to get yourself as healthy and as fertile as you can for your IVF cycle. 
So if you go to JacquelineHarris.com, it's at the very top of my website. Um, you'll see a, um, a click to download your IVF checklist. So go there and download that, please. I think it's really important you prepare for yourself for your cycle. And secondly, um, if you're watching this and you acknowledge that perhaps there's a lot more that you could be doing to treat your body um, as you're going into your IVF cycle or before that, um, because you have been diagnosed with endometriosis, please reach out to me and we can look at getting you booked in for a consultation. I'm available for face-to-face -face consultations in Launceston in Tasmania, or otherwise I work with lots of women online as well. Um, we work virtually, so we still get to see each other and chat just like we are here. Uh, so if that is something that you think perhaps you need to look at more, um, make sure you let me know. I'm going to wrap this up and leave this with you now, but my, my message with this is that there is a lot that you can do. If you've been diagnosed with endometriosis, you can really take your health and your fertility in your own hands, whether that is that you want to keep trying naturally before you go to IVF or you are just about to go into IVF in the next few months and you want to try and work on those contributing factors that might be playing a role in your endometriosis. I look forward to chatting to you again soon and reach out if you've got any questions. Bye, guys.